Students crave real-time experiences because they live in a world in which it's very common for them not to be in the time or the place that they are. They're so connected. They can be watching things on, on their phones that, that happen other times or talking to people in other places. A large lecture class has a huge performative side to it and students you know, expect, you know, treat you as if you're on television in uh, some ways. So you can't rely on knowing students personally and using the kind of personal relationship as a factor to, to make the you know, class work. So you need to kind of substitute way, modes of trust. And I have the students read a, a dialogue uh, by Plato, which they find very, very difficult. But over the course of the semester, they start to realize that they can do hard things, which is very empowering for students. If they can read something by Plato and figure it out, I mean, that's I mean, that's a really good thing, so that they feel unalienated from, from real intellectual life. It also sends a nice message early in the class that the class is, is serious. But you have to buffer it because they're not used to reading uh, things like this. So one trick that I do is um, I start off in the third or fourth lecture giving a very, as dry as I can possibly be, kind of background on Plato and the culture of ancient Greece. Perceptive students will note that I started off giving the lecture in my bare feet. Halfway through, I'm interrupted by one of the TAs who comes barging into the lecture claiming to be Phaedrus, and so I instantly have to grab my toga um, and become Socrates, and then my TA and I end up acting out the, the uh, whole dialogue. So when I first started teaching large lectures, I thought I could use the same techniques I'd used in small lecture discussion classes, but it's a very different animal. It's kind of like a cross between a political campaign and a courtship. And it's a political campaign because it's 16 weeks, and you need to kind of sustain it over the whole period and think about it as a narrative. And it's like a, a, a courtship because you know there are going to be ups and downs. The most important person in designing a syllabus is me. And that sounds narcissistic. But I try to design a syllabus in such a way that I can maintain my enthusiasm level throughout the semester. On the first day, you need to start and set a low baseline. Because if you have too much excitement, they would expect things to get even crazier. And I can't top that. So you set a low baseline, you be matter of fact, and you be relaxed. But you give them at least one thing that will intrigue them. So I have students choose between red pills and blue pills because they're going down the matrix. No one can be told what communication is. You take the blue pill, you go home. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Then there's the, the sort of trust creating opportunity early on, which is, you know, the third or fourth lecture it happens with the, uh, with the ephedrus. Right after the midterm, you need to do something that's going to get them re-enchanted. You know, you have to do a makeup note. You need to send flowers. You know, so, um, I mean, all the funnest topics of the class. I realized that the students on the last day of class don't want any more stunts. They just want just the facts, ma'am, and, you know, just let us go because they're, they're tired and we're tired. They have a sense of, you know, something's going on here and they don't know what it is. They get really curious. You know, I always get this on the evaluation that they realize that, you know, that this class is going to be fun, but it's also going to be serious and that coming to lecture is going to be worthwhile. One key thing that I found in teaching this kind of class is that um, if I'm bored, they're going to be bored. So I have to keep putting myself in situations where I don't know what's going to happen and where I have to kind of think and think live in real time to figure out what's going on. And, and in a way, I try to model that's what being a thinker is. That's what someone who takes communication seriously or takes inquiry questioning seriously is to go into situations where you don't know what's going on and, and think fast.